schools. Uh, and some people have kindly stepped in at short notice. But we can assure you that we've got a good diversity of views, at any rate, on our main panel. Um, other notices, um, we don't have a planned evacuation tonight. If the alarms do go off, please follow the green signs, go through the compass quad and gather in the car park. Uh, and can I also remind you to put your phones on silent? Okay, there'll be plenty of entertainment on stage. We don't need any, uh, any other interruptions tonight. Enjoy the evening. Over to James. Big thank you to Mr. Parbury there. Um, so yes, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the John Hamlin Question Time this year. Uh, this is an event where we can come together to engage with some of the most important issues facing our society today. I want to start by first expressing my utmost gratitude to our panel chairs, Luke Webb and Mr. Till, for their time and expertise in leading our discussion tonight. Tonight, we've assembled a panel of distinguished political leaders and students who will share their views on the critical issues that are shaping the future of the nation. They've generously given their time to be here tonight, and we are fortunate to have them with us. So can we first give them a round of applause to all of them? But the real stars of this event are you, the audience. It's your participation and engagement that will make this event a success. I encourage you to contribute to the discussion and ask the panel your questions. This is your chance to have your voice heard, to challenge the status quo, and to potentially shape the direction of our politics. Thank you for being here, and let's get started. Hey. Hello everybody, welcome to John Hamden for Question Time. We're really excited to be back and with our student panel. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves in a moment, but first of all we need to warm up the audience. Uh, obviously if you hear something that you disagree with this evening, you may decide not to react, we don't want any negative reactions, but if you were to hear something that you agree with and like the sound of to encourage our panellists, you might make a noise such as, for example... Hey. 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 Right. And you might give a hearty round of applause which would sound something a little bit like... Yes, Which will be lovely and encouraging. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, this is our student panel. I'm going to allow them to introduce uh, themselves. If perhaps we start down this end of the panel uh, and let our audience know who we have. Uh, hi, I'm Willow. I'm a member of the Labour Party and I help to run Pulse Off in my school at Wickham High. Hi, I'm Millie. I also help run Politic Society in Wickham High and I'm a member of the Liberal Democrats. Hi, um, my name's Vivek. I also lead the Political Society at Paul A's in my school. Um, I also work with Michelle Zondon as an aide, and I'm leading a work experience programme at Labour this year. Very much on the other side of our uh, panel. Hi, I'm Yasmin. I go to Becky High, um, and I lead my school's Model United Nations group, and I do history, English, and Spanish at A level. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm not a member of a political party. I can't choose between Labour and Green, but I'll get there someday. <laughs> and I take maths, geography, and politics for A level. Hi, I'm Tyler. Uh, I come to John Hamden and I am a member of the Conservative Party. Everybody, your student panel. <laughs> the question that we uh, are faced with uh, this evening is, uh, given the industrial action currently being taken by various unions, is that action justified in light of the current social and economic situation in the UK? So not too much to get your teeth into, just the entire current social and economic situation in the UK and whether industrial action is uh, justified. Uh, I wonder if, Yasmin, could we start with you? Yeah, um, I most definitely think that it is justified as there's no shocker, there's a cost of living crisis um, and 94% of adults in this country have reported an increase in cost of living. Um, food bank charities are seeing an increase in demand. Um, and people are struggling to heat their, heat their homes, put food on the table, and at the same time, the incredibly wealthy, the corporates are managing um, just fine, continuing to earn vast amounts um, uh, that, thank you, <laughs> that cannot be, even be compared to um, the average worker. So NHS, uh, nurses, teachers, transport workers are clearly struggling and are not being met with um, the wages and conditions that they deserve, let alone need um, to live comfortably. And therefore, given the current situation, I think it is definitely, uh, union action is definitely justified. Um, 
as we have a right to strike, we have a right to industrial action, and as a country that preaches the necessity of human rights um, and prides itself on being democratic, um, I think that it is definitely justified, otherwise people will continue to be exploited and the social, social situation will continue to deteriorate. Um, Vivek, coming to you. Yeah, so I agree with the notion that strikes are something that people could do in order to you know, seek better wages. I understand there is a cost of living crisis going on. But I more focus on the derived results from strikes, what people want out of strikes. And what most unions want out of strikes is better pay, better wages. And it's my belief that some unions have not been fair. They haven't, as this question said, haven't looked at the economic circumstances and have come to a conclusion whether a certain pay rise is acceptable. When most of the country is getting a 5% pay rise, we hear doctors wanting 35%. And despite, you know, we all love our doctors, love our nurses, they know, we know, the Labour Party knows, the government knows that this is simply unaffordable. And I don't see the point of striking over a pay deal that you simply know that you won't get. So we've got some positions established there. Um, Millie, your thoughts? Well, I do think that everybody has the right to strike if they don't think that they have the sufficient working conditions or wages. And I do think that on top of inflation being so high as it is, I think the statistics came out recently that food inflation reached 18%. And so people are really, really struggling. And if you have a mortgage and kids to pay for, and all the pressures that living in this country has on you, you do have the right to need the sufficient pay um, that you deserve to get for your work, especially with the NHS workers and teachers working incredibly hard. And you do have to ask for a little more than what you think you'll realistically get in order to get what you realistically Will get because it's a barter in a way you barter and you start higher and then you work down to something more achievable that will still help you. So. Thank you. Um, Tyler, your thoughts on this? Um, well, I guess my key point is that there's a difference between uh, workers deserving a pay rise and what is actually financially affordable. As if you want to give uh, all 3.6 million public sector workers a 10% pay rise, that's roughly 28 billion extra that has to be funded when we're already in a deficit of around 30 billion in terms of public finance. And this money can't just come from nowhere. It's got to either come through taxation, which were already the highest level of taxation since World War II, and it would cost around £1,000 per household to, to cover this extra finance, or you go through extra uh, government borrowing, which would only uh, devalue the, the pound even further, increase inflation, and that would just cut into the uh, wages of the whole country even further, including those people going on strike. Okay. Right, our final two panellists, find out what they, what they think. Uh, Willow, perhaps coming to you. I think that the current cost of living crisis is the cause of the um, one of the well a catalyst of the strikes. Ha um, the NHS teachers have not been paid enough for years, but um, the cost of living crisis has caused them to not be able to afford um, to live even uncomfortably. Um, so, like, and um, workers are extremely um, overworked. For example, in the NHS, um, there is. As of March 2022, there was 39,652 vacancies um, needing to be filled. So obviously those are being filled by the workers who are currently there. And so they need to be able to live comfortably because I wouldn't trust a nurse with my health if they are not able to live comfortably because that would not be good on them personally. Okay. Zoe, your take on this. 
I think that the industrial action taking place at the moment is not only justified, but I think it's necessary. Um, since 2008 and 2009, junior docs have faced a real terms pay cut of 26.1%. It's 11% for teachers, it's 8% for NHS nurses. This is ridiculous. As the cost of living is rising, wages are falling. And also, as Willow said, um, when nurses are overworked, when they're not paid well, they can't perform their jobs as well as they used to be able to. This is the same for junior doctors, paramedics. Since 2019, um, the leave due to mental health among paramedics has doubled. I mean, if we can't pay them properly and if they can't live properly, then how can we expect them to um, serve the country properly? As well as this, I think the argument that we can't afford it is very convenient given how much money the government has wasted in the last few years. If you consider that, um, sorry, give me a second. If you consider the £30 billion hole that Liz Trust blew in the economy overnight, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think they're asking for too much. If you consider that if you scrap the non-DOM tax status, you get an extra 3.2 billion every year from tax revenue. And that's something that Rishi Sunak himself benefits from, or at least his wife. So I think that the argument that we can't afford it is very, very convenient. <laughs> Anybody wanted to come back at anything that Zoe said there? Um, well, I guess... I, I agree with your points how there is a sort of hole that's been left in public finances, but your point that there is a hole isn't a solution. There is a hole and there is no finances to fund that. So just borrowing more won't solve that. So what is your, where is this money coming from? You identified there's a hole, but you didn't give a solution to the issue. You're sounding quite a lot like, like Labour. <laughs> that's, thank you. <laughs> quick, uh, quick right to reply. Um, well, I think that you say that there's no place for funding. My point is that there is. I mean, we scrapped the non-DOM tax status, we raised taxes. That will generate nowhere near as enough, enough as you think it will. Can I finish? Sorry. Um, <laughs> and I think that we, we can find the money. We can do it. It's just not convenient for the government. As I've pointed out, Rishi Sunak benefits from low taxes. I mean, we saw his, we saw his tax return release. Was it today or yesterday? I think that they can find the money. They're just not willing to do it because it benefits them. Do you want to give an example of how? I've just given one. Non Dom. Non Dom. <laughs> you want to get the whole deficit from Rishi Sunak? <laughs> <laughs> just on that he, point. He may be rich, but he's not that rich. <laughs> no, he's not. But my point is that it benefits people in government and powerful people, you know, corporate bosses, CEOs, that, that sort of people. They're stealing money from people who haven't got enough of it to pay people who have. They've got plenty. <laughs> Um, Vivek wanted to come back about something and then I'll take other points from panellists either in support or, uh, or, or backing up. A few up. things. First thing, again, commenting on Richard Sunak's personal finances as a way of targeting NHS pay deals is a pretty a cheap way of looking at it. I think you know, he's a successful work person. A lot of people criticise his wife, but not many people are willing to see where she came from and her life story and her dad's life story. I would recommend you guys all research that. On the thing about non-DOM status, I mean, it's convenient as well for the lay party to somehow think of pay deals as a one-off. You chuck a bunch of money and then all of a sudden the price is over. It's not that. Every year, there's got to be a pay deal every year. It's an independent process. You need to find sustainable ways of financing <coughs> public pay deals. And I think scrapping non-DOM status, the lay party loves using that word. You want to scrap non-DOM status, but you can't use that for everything. As my panel said, you only get a maximum four billion pounds from that. And that's not going to fund near as much as you need to fund a total 10% pay rise, which is, I think, what people was asking. And lastly, this word about businesses stealing or businesses, you know, big rich people steal from the poor. That's a very low way of looking at how economics works. I think we can all agree that businesses create jobs and that's how the economy works. I think we need a better argument to come back to. Thanks for that. I think um, Billy wants us to come in. Yes, uh, one point of that actually is that 40 billion, while won't, it won't save all of our economic problems, would certainly help with a couple. And one also valid, like, significant point is that the deficit is not the fault of the workers, of the people who work tirelessly every single day, but possibly the Tory government of the past 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm going to get a contribution from Yasmin. When other panellists have something to say, do kind of cue yourself in. And also people in the audience, if uh, you'd like to put a question to a panellist, something that you've heard, uh, do stick your hand up and uh, uh, when they've had a go, we'll try and get people in towards the end. But Yasmin. Um, so I just want to respond to the notion that the government simply can't do it. Um, as I think, so when big corporations or banks are, um, which are seen as too big to fail as they're these are pillars of um, our economy, so when they wobble or they are starting to feel the effects. Um, the government helps with tax breaks and incentives, but the same thing isn't happening for teachers and NHS workers who work tirelessly um, and aren't, aren't receiving anywhere near what they deserve and what they work for. So I think, uh, linking back to the question, they therefore need a tool um, to bargain with for this and to, um, to make their voices heard. So that is why especially in the current social and economic situation right now, industrial action is so necessary and so justified. Just a question to, to perhaps move this on a little bit, just as it were, where do we go from here? Uh, and I don't know if, Willow, you have a thought, anything you've heard so far, is there a way that we can actually push forward? And... There are some offers being given. Um, I think there was an offer of 5% for nurses, of an increase in 8% for HCAs. However, um, I think that even that is quite difficult when they've experienced a real-time pay cut and in a cost of living crisis, what would have been a good pay rise outside of this situation isn't good enough now. Um, and having nurses as well as HCAs and teachers dependent on benefits doesn't help the economy. If you want to boost the economy and you want to relax the pressure on the welfare state, paying, um, paying nurses, teachers, um, workers such as those, better would um, relax the pressure on the welfare state. Thank you very much. Um, there was a, a challenge made about the, the, the government's been in power for, for 12, 13 years. Uh, and whether this situation can be kind of put at the, put at the door of, uh, I suppose, the party that's been in charge. And I know we have representatives here, they may want to come back in on that. But I'm also keen to take questions uh, if anybody has a point they'd like to put to a panellist. Uh, and I don't know if we have a roving mic or people need to shout, but uh, is there anyone? We've got uh, ladies down at the front here. I don't know if, if there's a microphone. I'm not sure there is. You can shout, though, and I'll reiterate. Thank you for that. So what is the Conservative plan for growth? Uh, I don't know, Tyler, if you have a... a well, I on. guess what I'd say to that is that if you want uh, growth in GDP, what you need first is economic stability. That's the, the backbone of any uh, growing economy. And at the moment, with inflation as high as it is, I wouldn't call that economic stability. So if you want to suddenly give uh, pay rises to millions, that's all funded by borrowing. I'm not sure that would uh, reduce inflation too much and create a stable economy that can be invested in and invest in businesses that will grow uh, the GDP for the UK, which then will fund all public sector in the future. Because that, that's, how you, that's how you grow and fund the public sector, is through investing in businesses, growing GDP. You can't do that unless you have inflation tackled. And all these uh, pay rise of 10, 15 percent is doing the complete opposite. It's only fueling the infl inflation that's currently so high. Right. right to reply for anybody on the panel before we go back to the audience. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Willow, you can go first. Okay. Um, so, saying that like increasing the pay would um, be more uh, harmful to the economy. Um, well, if you're giving money to people who will spend it, and that's the um, working class, because those people need to spend their money, that would be putting money back into the economy. They would spend it on businesses, for example, for buying food and stuff like that. So that would be boosting the economy by giving money back to the economy. High spending is what fuels inflation further, though. Though, but if you tax the rich, then... Tax the rich, <laughs> OK. <laughs> if you tax the richest... Uh, the, the, what would you say? The tax already pay their fair share. What, 
there's no actual, actual uh, quantitative level to tax the rich, make them pay their fair share. What do you define as fair share? Questions out there? Let's uh, the write to reply. Um, Either Willow or, or Millie was looking to get in. On Tyler's question, what, what ought these rates to be? Tax the rich how much? Um, well, I would say that the top 1% of workers at the very, uh, of workers, of people at the very least, have enough money to spare that they can live comfortably with an extra, like, 5% of tax. How much do you think the top 1% earn in the UK? I don't have a number for that. Here, take a guess, take a guess. It's 140,000. Yeah, that, that is still relatively high, but it's not millions and millions. And also, you want to tax the, like, the hyper-rich. Uh, they're not, the hyper-rich are not restricted by international borders. Their money is everywhere. It's, it's, very, it's a very technical process to try and actually uh, tax those hyper-rich people because their money is not onshore. Like you want to, and also, the same with corporations. You want to tax BP for all their profits. You can only tax the profits that's actually generated in the UK. And these, these large companies, uh, all, they're large international firms, and you just look at their international profits, not the domestic UK profit, which is the only thing you can tax. And if you want to tax that, you talk about how we need a high growth economy. What do you think taxing uh, large corporations does? The large corporations are the ones who create all the jobs and generate the wealth. Let's take, that as a, let's take that as a question, Tyler. Um, Zoe, for example, right to come back. Hi. Um, so my first thing is that, what was my first thing? Oh, we've conveniently ignored Liz Truss blowing a 30 billion pound hole in the economy overnight, but we'll, we'll go past that. Um, what were you saying that, what were you saying? Are you not listening? I was, I've just forgotten. It's difficult to tax the, the yes. super rich. Are I they think cross that boundaries, for example? I think that the opposition that rich people avoid tax um, is not a great one. I mean, they do avoid tax, but you can close loopholes. You yeah, can, I you, agree. You can do things to make rich people pay tax. And I think the opposition that rich people are bad, they avoid tax as much as they can, is not great. I mean, I don't believe people are great, but I, they might be better than that. As well as that, you say that um, if we raise taxes, we'll drive away investment, etc., etc. I think that under Thatcher, the top, top rate of tax was 60%. So I think the idea that um, if we raise taxes, people will be driven away, I think that's nonsense. I think that we've been slowly cutting tax, and it's become the accepted thing that taxes are lower. It's become what's politically acceptable. And any suggestion of a deviation from that is completely out of the question. So I think that actually we can raise tax, and it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, come to Millie, and then uh, um, Yasmin hasn't had a, a, a say for a, a little bit, but Millie first. Um, may I quickly go back to what was said in response to that question? Now, you said um, it's not viable to do, um, raise workers' wages and not fund that correctly. And let's look back to maybe four months ago when the Tory party thought it was completely viable to spend billions on unfunded tax cuts. So, what... If you don't think spending money on workers is justifiable, how can you justify what happened in the past four months? I, I, I Let's just take it as a question for a minute, because I'm keen to hear from Yasmin too, and then you'll have a reaction. Well, well, so I never justified the... Yeah, sorry, um, Tyler. Just oh, yeah. sorry. Just for a moment. <laughs> Yasmin, next. Um, I just want to respond to the point about... Um, you were saying about the highest taxes, I think you said 140,000? Yeah, the one um, percent. Yeah, and as you said in your point, you said that even that is not with the amount of tax is still not um, sustainable with uh, such high tax. Well, how come those people are um, paying the same amount as tax as the wealthiest, wealthiest, the ultra millionaires? How is that fair? And um, why is that money, um, if, if those two people are being able to be uh, taxed the same amount, surely the ultra millionaires, the billionaires, the people that, and the, the big corporations that can afford so should be taxed more and this can therefore be driven back into the NHS workers, the teachers, the people who really need it and are contributing to our society. The fact that there are so many disruptions um, when there is strike action just shows how uh, vital these sectors are to the functioning, um, the smooth functioning of our society. Tali, you've got a quick reply and then I'm going to come to Vivek. Um, you've had a few questions put to you there. Oh, sorry, what was the, what was the main question again there? Um, it was about, it was following on from your point that the highest, like, one, uh, 
tax earners are paying the same amount of tax as um, like ultra billionaires? Well, well I, I guess what I'm, my view would be is that you need tax cuts in the sort of middle earners. They're the one. They're the large spenders. But I also have this fact that it's like 27 million people saying pay the same income tax as around 200,000 people. 200,000 people they pay a third of income tax and 27 million people also pay a third. So it is very disproportionate as we currently are. The, the, I think Rishi Sunak said it in PMQs a few weeks ago, uh, at, at, the in, at the current time it's the highest the rich have ever paid in tax. So I, I always find oh, people always think that the rich are some endless money pool that can just be constantly uh, constantly tax and tax, but I, I don't think you should always be demonising uh, people generating wealth, because uh, name what you, all people who have, who are the millionaires, the business owners, they, they haven't done that right on, completely on their own, they, they've created businesses, they've created jobs, they're the ones creating wealth, and that's what you have to incentivise, and it's not incentivising people to be entrepreneurs and create businesses if you're just going to tax them even more. Okay, so take a pause there and come to the Vivek skin to get back in. Um, well, I've said a few things. First thing, I'm a believer in real property. I believe in, you know, it's all good symbolism, you know, tax more, help people. But in reality, none of that's going to happen. You're not going to increase the tax burden. No party will increase the tax burden now because it's the highest level in 70 years. So I think... While you may make arguments for that, it's simply not going to happen. I think the question from the audience was how do we create growth? And the biggest thing that's eroding our growth now is inflation, which is ridiculously high. And that's fueled mainly by the war in Ukraine, fueled by COVID, the aftermath of COVID. And yes, um, coming on to Liz Truss's terrible budget, first minute, there is a difference between making a mistake and then accepting, putting your hands up and saying, yes, we made a mistake, but we're going to move on from that. 30 billion that was lost overnight, you'd be happy to know that Jeremy uh, Hunt came in and reversed nearly all the measures that were announced in that budget. And the damage to the financial markets has now been recovered. So you can go back to that point again and again, but the damage to the markets, as I said, has been recovered. And I think, you know, this idea that if you tax the rich so much that you can help fund the public service, I don't think that's a good way of looking at it. You want to create sustainable economic growth. And I think the best way you can create sustainable economic growth is you tackle inflation, reduce government debt, and you incentivise businesses to invest, because right now business investment is the lowest levels it's ever been. Okay, I'm just going to pause you there. I'm going to, because time, time the enemy has once more, it's getting the better of us. Um, I'm going to invite, and this is perhaps a, a slightly putting you on the spot kind of thing, but to sort of sum up what you would like your audience to take away from your message in a sort of pithy two or three word, dare I say, political slogan that they will remember if you were to encapsulate what you're trying to get across. While I'm speaking, hopefully you're formulating it very quickly. Uh, and, uh, and then everyone can have a final word. Uh, and I don't mind what order you go in, because some people might have theirs ready. But uh, Willow, if you do, have, what, should, what should these people take away? Pay the workers. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, the workers should not have to suffer the consequences of a deficit that was created by the Tories. Yeah. Vivek. Be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ensure people's human rights are maintained by taking industrial action and give the workers what they deserve. Zoe? Can I tack on to Willows? Um, pay the workers, we can afford it. <laughs> I'd more just say it's ultimately, ultimately there is a difference between deserving and what's financially viable and I think that's the, the key message. No one doesn't want to pay the public sector what they, what they want and deserve, it's ultimately can we afford it and I do disagree Thank with you. your point that we can. Nice. Thank you very much. The student panel. Thank you all very, very much. There shall now be a short intermission.
Good evening, and welcome to John Hamden Grammar School's Question Time 2023. I'm Luca Webb. I was, uh, I'm an old boy here, and uh, I'm, it's much nicer sitting in this chair than running around organising this thing as I was four years ago, dealing with Brexit votes being scheduled on the same day. So hats off to the team tonight who have done a brilliant job getting an illustrious panel together. Now, I told Mr Till not to set, set the bar too high for the chairing, and he's completely disregarded my comments. Uh, as uh, the panel were uh, completely well-informed and very eloquent, so I think, you know, we've got a tough act to follow here, guys. Um, but uh, I'm going to introduce the, the panel, and uh, just, to, to, just before that, to, to uh, give you an idea of the, the format, so just like the, 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 the BBC show, uh, we've had some questions submitted in as, 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 you have, um, have, as you've arrived, and we've selected those, and I'll be uh, uh, inviting those who we've selected to, to stand up and ask their question to our panel. Um, but, but, but as we move between questions, please feel free to, to, to put your hand up. I can, I can just about see you all uh, with, with the glaring lights. Um, and, uh, and I will try and get as much audience participation uh, as possible as we pose questions uh, to our panel. And without further ado, at the end here, we have uh, Alex Sobel, MP. Uh, Alex uh, is an old boy from John Hamden. We're very pleased to be welcoming him back and has been the Member of Parliament for Law, um, Leeds North West since 2017. He used to run the regional body Social Enterprise Yorkshire and the Humber from 2009 until 2017, and in 2012 was elected to Leeds City Council, leading its commitments aiming to improve air quality and combat climate change, and is now Shadow Minister for Nature. So welcome, Alex. Thank you. And next to him, we have Hugo Reisenberg, who is chair of the Beaconsfield Young Conservatives. Hugo has been actively engaged in politics for many years and was formerly director of communications for the campaign group ED Aware and also appeared on Channel 4's hashtag Beyond Z. Welcome, Hugo. Thank And on my right, we have another JHGS old boy. They can't get enough of us tonight, Josh Westerling, um, who previously worked for the Joe Cox Foundation and the think tank British Future, and he currently leads political engagement for a national policy organisation supporting community and local business, and was previously the policy officer for the Chesham and Amersham constituency Labour Party. Welcome, Josh. <laughs> on my left, Richard Thompson. Scottish National Party MP, who's been the representative for the Gordon constituency in Aberdeenshire since the 2019 general election. And from 2012 to 2020, he sat uh, on Aberdeenshire Council, serving as its leader from 2015 to 2017. And he's also been deputy editor of the Scots Independent newspaper since 2017. And if we get round to this on the debate, uh, is a supporter of Hamza Youssef, I understand, for the SNP leadership <laughs> uh, upcoming next week. So, welcome, awesome. Richard. And next to Richard, we have Harrison Griffiths, the Communication Officer for the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, who graduated from Exeter University in 2021, studying politics before gaining an MA in American History and Politics from University College London. And before joining the IEA, he was an intern focusing on public affairs at a trade organisation. Welcome, Harrison. And last, but by no means least, we have Paul Henry, a Liberal Democrat councillor on Beaconsfield Town Council, who served since 2003 and was the town's mayor uh, before that. And he's a trustee of Better Connected Beaconsfield, a charity supporting those less fortunate in the town, and has been governor of Frimley Health NHS Foundation Trust since 2014. Welcome, Paul. <laughs> Okay, uh, and with that, I think we'll move to our first question, uh, which uh, is from Amanda White. So, Amanda, you could just uh, make yourself known and the uh, microphone will come to you. Hi. Why is the government so obsessed with reducing immigration when there's a 1.2 million gap in the labour market? Okay, okay. Why is the government obsessed with reducing immigration when there is a 1.2 million gap in the labour market? And, and Alex, I'm, I'm going to go to you first. Well, you, you, shouldn't agree? you shouldn't ask a lay politician why the government does something, <laughs> so he maybe should have <laughs> gone somewhere else first. But, um, uh, I mean, absolutely right, we have a big labour shortage in this country. Uh, that's why we recently had a, a, a shortage of tomatoes, 
cucumbers, lettuce, etc. on shelves. Actually, at the height of that shortage, I was in Ukraine, and there was no shortage in Ukraine, and they're in a war situation. So, um, you know, we need to have a balanced approach to immigration. Uh, we need to ensure that we balance the needs of the country with who comes here, uh, and um, that's not what's happening currently. And I think that part of that is, is about, unfortunately, Suella Braverman is a very regressive figure and wants to utilise immigration as a political football and as a culture war issue, rather than looking at it constructively about what the needs of the country are and what the needs, and we're not talking about economic migration here, but what the needs of asylum seekers are and, and how the system should work as a whole. The system is broken. I can tell you as somebody who's got a big case workload, it is such a big backlog, both of people applying for work visas and people applying for asylum because the Home Office is effectively broken under her leadership. Yep. Okay. Harrison, do you agree? Uh, yes, wholeheartedly. Uh, after our departure from the European Union and the end of free movement, we have already seen not just the figures in terms of labour shortage, but when it comes to just fruit, for example, we literally have fruits and vegetables that are rotting on and they are completely unpicked because, well, Nobody is going to go in and take the job. I do not know, and I'm not sure anybody can honestly say they know, what the optimum wage, how many the optimum workers are to go and do a particular job. And so uh, this sort of solution that immigration sceptics have, which is, well, yes, we do have people outside of the workforce, uh, sort of uh, chronic unemployed in the UK, well, yes, but that's sort of a, for a variety of other reasons, in particular when it comes to waiting lists for the National Health Service. But if people do not want to do a job at a point where uh, consumers are willing to pay for what they produce, then there is no solution other than to go and get somebody who is willing to do that. And I'm, it's very arbitrary, I think, to have a national border uh, stepping in the way of them doing so. So I, I do agree. I'm, I'm not sure why. OK. You go, I'm presuming you're not going to be quite so agreeable as our, as our well, first two I'm going to offer a slightly different, alter I'm going to, an alternative take on that, which is that this policy is not about stopping immigration and immigration as a whole in light of the job market because we know that we need immigration and we know that it's good for us. My policy, you're referring to the current asylum plan, which has been in the news. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, this is about, fundamentally, it's about control. Um, we cannot afford to have a system by which anyone... Um, coming particularly from Calais in small boats on making a completely treacherous journey. Uh, these people are at significant risk doing this, knowing with the current legislation, if they make it here, that they're going to be offered asylum. Um, they're putting themselves in incredible danger. It's funding a multi-million pound industry, which is now people trafficking into the UK. Um, and I think we need to consider stop the boats. It's about control. You know, We need to find a way that we can choose democratically how many people we're going to let in and we can't just allow a free fall of people coming into the UK. We need to have control and we need to democratically choose how we are going to bring people into this country because fundamentally we know that immigration is a great thing and leads to prosperity for everyone. So why is the government so obsessed with, with reducing it to go back to Amanda's question? Well, it's... The current policy is going to stop people coming here illegally. We're not necessarily look, looking at stopping people coming here through legal routes. You hear the government constantly go on about um, the, the points system, the Australian-based point system. It's a fundamentally good idea because ultimately we want to be able to choose who comes here um, so that we can get the best people from around the world into this country. But there's a 1.2 million gap. Amanda, what, 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 do you, what, do you, what do you think of what's been said so far? I, I, I'm happy to bring you back in or anyone else. Please raise your hand. I, I'd, I'd like to hear from our, from our audience. I think it has just been... I mean, the, the focus on immigration is just motivated by politics. It's used as a weapon by the Conservatives. We do need immigration, but they've basically hoisted themselves by their own petard by making it so toxic to the voters that they can't actually be honest and say, actually, we've got 1.2 million people vacancies that we can't fill. We are going to have to go to get immigration or the economy is just screwed. So that's where we are. OK, Paul, uh, at the end here, so I think we've got two things here. We've got the government's uh, uh, plan on, on, on stopping the boats, one of Rishi Sunat's key priorities, and we've got their approach to immigration and we, 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 yep. we, you know, we've got a shortage of workers on, on both of those points, you know. 
What are they getting wrong? What are they getting right? Yeah, I, I don't think the government is trying to reduce immigration at all. Uh, what they're trying to do is replace the immigration that we had before, which they call uncontrolled, i.e. freedom of movement, with immigration from somewhere else. And uh, as many people are coming in now as they were before, just that they are being controlled. And I just want to make one point, and I, I like to make this strongly. The Conservatives always say illegal immigrants. Crossing the channel in a boat up until the new law is passed is not illegal. There is, a, the, the, there is an international understanding that if you are fleeing from war or any other um, situation which would qualify you for refuge, you can cross the channel to a country, you can go into any country without a passport and seek refuge. And so this myth that they are illegal immigrants is just a lie. And they get away with it because everybody believes that it's illegal. It's not illegal. They are reducing, what they want to reduce is asylum seekers coming across the channel. And the reason they come across the channel is because the Tories over years have reduced all of the other options to zero. There is no other way of coming as a refugee <coughs> to the UK other than in a small boat over the channel. So what did they expect to happen if there was no other way to do it? Yes, we take Ukrainians, brilliant, I have the badge, right? Yes, we take um, selective other countries where Ira Iraqis that we've, uh, that we've been involved in before, but tiny, tiny numbers, tiny numbers. Germany has taken a million refugees, min more than that, million, 1.4 million, I think, refugees over the last two years into their borders. We take refugees, we refuse to allow them to work, we refuse to pay them benefits of any value. Germany comes in, they get full benefits, they are allowed to work, and they become productive from day three. Because they, they you know, and, and I really don't understand, and I, it's, it's xenophobia in the end. To, to, go back to, to go back to Marta's question, are you saying, in addition to the, you know, the humanitarian motives behind supporting refugees, you know, to go back to that £1.2 million yep. gap in, in, in the labour market, are you saying we should be you know, incentivising them to, to, to be able to... If I remember uh, correctly, uh, when, we, when we exited the European Union and stopped freedom of movement, in the years following, before we literally, before we really left the European Union, 1.1 uh, million... Europeans left the UK and that's why there's no one to serve in the pubs that's why some of the supply chains don't work that's why we can't pick the carrots right because they left because of our unwelcome scenario that we built through Brexit and we have to refill that we have to we have to get workers in because the country needs the growth that that kind of productiveness is going to bring Richard you're nodding <clears throat> Absolutely, I didn't expect to find quite so much consensus uh, across the, the, the panel on this issue. But, uh, I know we have to move on in a minute. I mean, you know. But yeah, I mean, stop, the, the slogan of stopping the boats, I mean, it's, it's quite clearly not about control. It's just about headlines. And the illegal migration bill, or the illegal illegal migration bill, as it's being termed <laughs> around the, the House of Commons and certain quarters at the moment, Actually, the government's own legal advice has estimated that there's only about a 50% chance of the bill being found lawful if it's mm. ever actually put to the test. And I actually have a sneaking suspicion that the Conservative government are quite happy about that, putting forward a bill that is not founded on a solid legal uh, basis. Because if it is struck down in the Supreme Court or elsewhere, for example, it will play extremely well, the Conservatives, I think, believe, with uh, many of those whom they would wish to be voting for them. Now, if you, don't, if you don't want people to be coming here illegally, you need to provide safe and legal means. And Paul is right, nobody is inherently illegal. Yep. And the bill that is before us, it means that if you do take that illegal route and then try to escape, your application for citizenship or asylum or whatever mm -hmm. will not automatically will not be accepted which puts all the hands in the power the, all the power in the hands of those we're trying to take the power away from mm -hmm. 
If it wasn't for migrant labour, many industries in this country would simply not function. Agriculture, the agri-food sector, or NHS would grind to a halt. So just on that, Richard, I mean, you know, there's 45,700 people came in uh, on, 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 on boats, refugees seeking asylum in 2022. We're talking about 1.2 million here. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the government's plan to stop the boats I I is wrong, but, but what would you be doing to, to actually, you know, fill that gap of, of, of 1.2 million people? Well, we could stop uh, being quite such a xenophobic little country. Uh, as we have been over Brexit, we could start trying to make people feel welcome again because that is why food is rotten in the field. Look, I'll give you a little anecdote here, which I bear with me. I think it's uh, it's short and I think it captures it. At the office my mother used to work at in Edinburgh, there was a girl came over from Poland called Isabel. Isabel could barely speak English. She was in there as an office cleaner. Isabel taught herself English. She now employs about 10 people in a cleaning company. It's the people with get up and go that quite frequently got up and came here. And Isabel and her family are now making an absolutely tremendous contribution out of all proportion to what could reasonably have been expected if we looked at this through the prism of who's got enough points to come here and it were only attracting the very best. Because inadvertently we would have screened out some of the very best like Isabel like that. We need people to come here with their drive, their, upper, their talent, we need to give them the opportunity to succeed and we need to look for them as equals making a valued contribution to our country and its services. Josh, I think you get the, the, the final word on this before we're going to move on, unless we've got any, any keen members of the audience who, who want, to, want to say something. Uh, uh, we've got, in fact, we've got a student there, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to Josh first, and, we'll, and I'll, I'll come back to you soon. Cheers, Luca. I think in terms of the debate around immigration, I think we have to be kind of careful with how we talk about it and being very clear when we're talking about the immigration system, when we're talking about the asylum system. I think... In terms of the politics of it, it's quite clear why the government are going down the road of stop the boats in uh, their wording. I think they see that as a way to appeal to those um, voters in the so-called red wall seats that they first won in 2019, an issue that they, I think those voters do care about and that um, Richard Sunak and his government think this is an issue that they can mobilise, that can play... Um, to uh, those races' interest. I think the political danger with um, their stop the boats policy is that it's not going to work. It's there, there isn't going to be a reduction in channel crossings as a result of that policy. I take Richard's argument that they might want that fight with the judiciary around this. Um, but I think having made a promise that we're going to kind of stop crossings across the channel and then however many months, year later, if those voters in the Red Wall are still turning on the six o'clock news and still seeing those channel crossings, I think it would be another broken promise from the Conservative Party on um, asylum, but also on immigration. Like, you saw it with David Cameron's But, but in promise. terms of this 1.2 million people, do you agree with Richard, actually, that this policy, uh, you know, terming us a, a, you know, as a xenophobic nation is, is how we're now portrayed to the, to the international world, as, as, as Richard says. Do you think that policy is having a, a direct impact on this 1.2 million, million shortage uh, in the labour force? So I don't, I don't think that the skill shortage is a result of the asylum policy. I think it's a result of how the points-based system is functioning at the moment. And I think that's an open debate to be had about what kind of immigration system that we want post-Brexit. And I think ultimately the vote in 2016 wasn't necessarily to reduce immigration. It was for about, about controls on immigration. And I think now it's actually, I think it can be a healthy thing in this country that we do have that debate. I think ultimately the left, the argument that we need to make needs to be beyond talking about migrants just as economic units. We need to talk about the cultural contribution that people make to this country and have a real kind of rounded debate about that. OK, right. I think we're going to have to move on. Lots to cover here. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mike Harding to ask his question. Mike, where are you? There you are. Oh, hi. Evening panel. Um, my, quest my question is, has Boris Johnson been responsible for the start of a new era, new era of politics which is devoid of integrity and honesty? Well, 
I, I'm going to go, as you can imagine, to, to, to Hugo first. Obviously, the question here in the, way, in the wake of the Privileges Committee of the House of Commons investigating statements made by Boris to Parliament and, and whether or not he intentionally or recklessly misled Parliament. Did he, Hugo, and uh, is the assessment we just heard from the audience correct? OK, so your question was, has Boris Johnson brought about a new era of a lack of integrity in politics? Um, and I think, in effect, you're giving him too much credit because I don't think politics has ever had a lot of integrity. Um, <laughs> I think if you go back throughout the years, it's scandal upon scandal. And often what you see is prime ministers are toppled by a scandal, as Boris Johnson was. I mean, if you cast your mind back to New Labour, uh, we had Tony Blair with the Cash for Honour scandal, in which Bernie Eccleston, uh, a Labour donor, was giving significant funds of money. He was then um, made a peer. Um, was he not made a peer in the end? He wasn't made a peer in the end, due to the scandal, my bad. Um, but these scandals happen. You know, we've seen um, two big Labour scandals recently. Uh, the first one... It's not Jared. me, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, no, not you. Um, <laughs> Jared O'Mara, uh, convicted of six counts of fraud for putting £20,000 of UK taxpayer money on his cocaine habit. Um, we also had Claudia Webb, who, after a disagreement, threatened to acid attack another woman, and these are two Labour MPs. So I don't, think, I don't think that Boris Johnson has brought about a new era of a lack of integrity in politics. I think this is a societal issue, and I think as a society we need to look... Not everyone's perfect... This is granted, you know, I'm sure there's people in your own life that you don't think are perfect. Um, and that also applies to politics. There are people that aren't perfect, and I don't think you can expect all 650 MPs to behave like saints all the time. Right, well, uh, let, let's, hear, let's hear from one of those MPs. I mean, uh, a, a pretty bleak picture Hugo's presenting here. You know, apparently, you know, po politicians for all parties responsible for this, you know this sinful chaos that, uh, that, that we're apparently in. I mean, how, how do you see it, Richard? Are you, well, are you taking part of the blame here that we're getting from Hugo? Well, can I just begin by congratulating Hugo and managing to answer a question about Boris Johnson without <laughs> mentioning Boris Johnson. He's <laughs> a good politician. I'm sure there's a, a, a glowing yeah. career in, in, in politics. Yeah. <laughs> but not, not, not the first and won't be the last. Uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> but in terms of Boris Johnson responsible for a new era, sadly... Uh, Probably not. I think he built on some of the malaise that was there in terms of our, uh, our, our media culture, the short collective attention span. And, um, you know, t we tend to, you know, we're, we're all responsible for the politicians that, that, that we elect. So ultimately, I think there's been a collective uh, amnesia and oversight of uh, Boris Johnson. We all knew that he was, uh, had a, a, a slightly distant relationship from the <laughs> truth. And uh, people were too many people at too many stages in his career, whether it was uh, his headmaster at Eton, uh, right the way through his uh, jobs in the, in the press, were, were, did not stamp on that and deal with that uh, as it should have happened. I mean, I think he got sacked from a job at the Times for as he put it sandpapering a quote. Michael Howard, to his great credit, sacked him as a Conservative opposition spokesperson for lying about something. But right throughout his career, he's someone who has been indulged. Now, I, I remember one of my, the, the times I kind of rose to prominence earliest in my time in the House of Commons was uh, I had a Prime Minister's question and I said that nobody was really all that bothered about the reality of parties or cake, they just wanted the Pinocchio Prime Minister to pack his bags and go. And despite the fact that the Prime Minister quite clearly had been telling lots of fibs about Partygate, um, because of the arcane rules of the House of Commons, I was the one who had to withdraw my comment lest I get kicked out. So, no, I don't think that <clears throat> he's responsible on it himself, but he is, a, he is a symptom. He is he is symptomatic of the culture that we have created. And I okay. think that we need to do a great deal to eradicate that because we need to pay attention, we need to be engaged, and we should start rewarding the politicians that we think should be rewarded and start penalising those who exhibit the behaviours that we don't wish to see. And that's the only way you prevent a future Boris Johnson from rising to power. Good, Alex. Alex, I'm yeah. going to go to you. We've I heard mean, Richard say that, that Boris is a, a symptom of this era of yeah. dishonesty, but, but you know, Hugo says that Labour are just as much of a, of a symptom. So, so I think that it's, it's how the parties respond to things, because you have bad actors in all uh, walks of society. In business, there are bad actors. There are CEOs recently who've had to, had to be removed. Uh, uh, even in the teaching profession, there are bad actors, not, not at John Hamden, but in other places. Um, so, Jared and Claudia both had the whip removed. Jared was an MP elect in 2017, wasn't allowed to re stand for the Labour Party in 2019. So, we, 
removed bad actors from the party. The Conservative Party made Boris Johnson Prime Minister, then made Liz Truss Prime Minister, and now made Rishi Sunak, who was fined in Partygate, Prime Minister. The Labour Party removed the whip from those three, probably. Um, so it's quite different uh, in, in approach. What we need to remember, actually, is Boris Johnson isn't, isn't the pinnacle of this type of politics. This really um, reached its pinnacle under Donald Trump, and thankfully the American people then elected Joe Biden as president. This sort of populist sort of, um, you know, very distant relation to the truth, uh, a sort of culture war approach is something that, that unfortunately is going on around the world, and we do need to restore um, decency to policy. We've been here before, Richard Nixon is a good example, you know, no better than any of these characters. So it is possible to do that, but you just need people with real leadership, and that's why I hope for the next election we'll see Keir Starmer elected as Prime Minister of this country. Well, I'd, I'd like to get some, some comment from the audience. Uh, anyone, anyone brave enough to... I, I, don't, I don't see any... I, I see, I see Miss, Miss, Mrs Summers here from, from John Hamden. Hello. Sorry if you've heard my baby, everybody. Um, thank you for putting up with that. But um, on the politics note, on the populism note, I just wondered if you thought, are we seeing some improvements in that? Do you think we're coming through the storm of this populist era? Are things getting better? Or is it as bleak as, as some of the panellists have been indicating so far? I'm hoping for some hope here, is what I'm really going for. I'm going to allow Josh to come in on that, and we'll go back to you, Alex. So I think on the populism point, I think we probably have turned a degree of a corner. I think you can see the election of Schultz in uh, Germany, you can see the election of Albanese in um, Australia, and I think Keir Starmer is very much in that ilk of a, perhaps not the most um, kind of charismatic uh, leader, but clearly someone who kind of has values, has integrity, um, which, yeah, very much seems to be something that Boris Johnson is uniquely unfamiliar with. And I think, Going back to the original question, I, I don't think Boris Johnson kind of uh, heralded a new era of politics in that sense. I think we have to look really closely at how Westminster functions as an institution. I, as Alex and Richard will know better than me, but I don't think the way that we kind of choose our politicians is necessarily the best way to get the best people into those jobs. I think once you get there, Westminster can be a really lonely place to work. It can be a really difficult place to work. You don't kind of have a HR team that you can go to when things aren't um, going well. You're there for incredibly long hours. You're really far away from your family. So I think we have to kind of think about how our politics functions and how we can kind of encourage the best people in our public life to go into politics. OK. So point that sort of relates a little bit to that. I think politics in general incentivizes the creation of dishonest characters. So by having, particularly in a unitary state like the UK, one village, one institution parliament that has so much power, so much of an ability to intervene in the affairs of all of us, in fact in this country with parliamentary sovereignty, theoretically unlimited ability to wield power who are often, there are of course exceptions, who are often the types of people who are going to go after that prize, that central prize, and what do you need to do in order to get it? Mm -hmm. And in answer to both of those questions, it suggests that the sort of, even if you start out with noble intentions, the types of moral compromises that you need to make in order to serve at the highest level in such a powerful institution you can see how that would push people towards that type of dishonesty and corruption. Uh, but I, I, I think, I don't think there's any solving that without either significantly sort of diminishing the role, size, scope of the state or significantly decentralising power across the country. Because that is a big prize that people are going for, number 10, the leadership of this country. And I don't think you're often going to get very nice people doing that job or very moral people doing that job. 
Dear, oh dear. Well, it's... I'm not sure about that. It really is a bleak picture. Paul, help us out here. Do you see a brighter future ahead? I mean, we've, we've now gone into, actually, no one's disagreeing that we are in an era devoid of integrity and honesty in politics. We've heard that the way we're electing our, our politicians is, is, is a cause of that. And actually, you know, the, 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 the route to the top uh, is a cause as well. Do you, do you agree? Is it, do you have anything more hopeful that we I, can conclude on here? I think... Uh, no, I don't, actually. Uh, uh, I think the way we run our politics on a much deeper level is the problem. Um, what we have is a pugilistic two-party state where the job is to rubbish the other party all the time. The job is to, uh, building on your comments, is to be the joker who appeals to the electorate. Who, and, and Boris is very good at that. Boris is very, very intelligent. He plays the fool, but he's not a fool. He's very, very intelligent. He's got a, a personality that appeals to a certain type of person. He's brilliant. He's articulate. But he's not very good at running the country. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the problem. You know, we choose. We're, it, we're getting more presidential in our, in our view, as we're saying, you know, what we're, we're choosing the man who's going to save us. And it's not the man or the woman who's going to save us. It's the policies of the party that is in power. Or even better, and I would say that as a Liberal Democrat, it's the coalition of parties that get together who come up with a compromise which everybody can accept, like most other countries in Europe, where the, the economy is steady over a long, long term because there is consensus. The problem with our country is we have no consensus. Even the Conservative Party has no consensus. And I cite the three prime ministers that we've had over the last year. Right? How different is Liz Truss's idea of success to Rishi Sunak's? They're in the same party, for God's sake. So how can we expect that the next prime minister is not going to have a completely different view unless the party articulates a sensible, acceptable policy that we can all buy into. And they don't, because the pugilistic attitude is overriding. And that's because we have a two-party system. Um, okay. So, am I optimistic? No, I'm not. Because we, there's a lot at the bottom that we need to change <coughs> to get away from this. Okay, and I'll... I'll, 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 I'll I'm seeing a nodding head no, here from, no, from no, Alex, and I'll, so I'll, I'll let you go come back on some of these points. Anyway. Obviously, we sat here in John Hamden's school. John Hamden was a member of Parliament who railed against the uh, power of an absolute monarchy and wanted to bring checks and balances in the system. And, and John Hamden's school's only ever got one MP elected, which is me, so maybe part of the solution is to get more ex-boys from John Hamden into Parliament. Uh, but no, no, on a more serious note, I think, I think the question was a bit more international than the UK. Uh, to give some hope. So, um, you know, we had some examples uh, from Richard, but actually the biggest one for me, one of the most um, right-wing populist uh, leaders who was absolutely destroying our planet was uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and he lost to Lula. And it showed that the Brazilian system worked, that democracy worked. This year, we're going to have an election in Turkey. President Erdogan has been there 20 years. All the polling say he should lose. He's a terrible populist. He's done horrible things to the Kurds. He's playing a double-sided game with Ukraine. Um, and the only way, um, and I was with the pulse yesterday, he's working in Turkey, that he can win is by stealing the election. And this is, the, this, is, this is part of the issue. What we need to do is ensure that we have free and fair elections in countries, that, that people in power don't utilise the media, the judiciary and other organs uh, with unfair state power, and we have right checks and balance system globally. And that sort of central pillar of democracy. Israel is another one. You know, my parents came here from Israel, and um, what's happening in Israel is an absolute scandal. Half a million people are out on the streets regularly in Israel because the Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu wants to directly appoint Supreme Court and other justices. And that is not how a democracy works. The state cannot dictate who dispenses justice, including electoral justice. And for him, it's mainly so he doesn't want to go to prison himself for corruption. Um, so in some places, I do have faith. But in others, we need to strengthen uh, 
the, the democratic institutions and checks and balance system. And actually, in this country, one of the things about this country is that respect that people around the world have for our legal system. And you talk to people in business and you say, why are you here? Why is your business here? Nothing to do with Brexit freedoms or anything like that or, or um, you know, the people or anything that it's our legal system. They say Britain has the best legal system in the world. So I hope that what, when, what we haven't seen is a big attack on our legal system. I hope we won't. We need it strengthening, but we need lots of other things happening as well. But we do, the other thing is we do need okay. to devolve power away from Westminster. Right. We might come on to that later. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we're hearing that Boris, you know, to, to sum up, that Boris Johnson is a product of the system. You go to give a final word to you. However, you know, um, we're hearing from Alex that the, the scandals that you point to uh, Labour are dealing with, you know, the whip's been removed. What, what, how do you come back on that? Do you think that, that, that enough action has been taken on the, you know, the accusations been made against Boris as he was Prime Minister? Uh, well, I think the system fundamentally is working. Boris Johnson yesterday spent uh, roughly five hours being grilled on select committee. And I think that just goes to show that even if you're the Prime Minister, if you do something wrong, the system's working because he's the one that's now sat there having to defend his career, which potentially might be soon coming to an end, uh, given if he does face a by-election, um, it's not a very good picture for him in Uxbridge and South Ryslip, um, no matter what people try and claim about that. To, I mean, today you've seen some of his close allies going in for that. Um, another point I wanted to touch on... Very if, briefly. Very briefly, very briefly. If you're an employer and you want the best people working. We are employers of members of parliament. They work for us. Um, and if you want the best workers, you need, to, you need to pay them well. And I think we need more people wanting to be MPs so that we've got more people to choose from. And I think one way we do that is maybe by paying MPs more. Because these people, I know, I'm sure you can testify to it, Alex. How many hours do you work a week? No more than a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I can tell you, from, from my personal experience of MPs I know, these people are working from the crack of dawn until right in the evening. I mean, these are hours I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, and if we want the best people, if we want to bring the talent that we've got in the private sector, if we pay MPs more, we might get more people wanting to do the job. OK. Not the conclusion I was expecting uh, uh, there uh, about Boris Johnson. We should, we should pay him more, pay him more. apparently. <laughs> pay him more. I think there he earns enough. I think he's the exception yeah, to the no, rule. So we are. OK, <laughs> thank you for that. We're, we're going to move on. And now a question which I know affects young people in particular. And we've got a lot of young people in the audience. And that's from George Irvin Flynn. Where are you, George? There you are. Uh, recently, the affordability of a home against the average adult income hit its lowest since the Victorian era. What are the causes of the issue and what possible solutions are there to make home ownership easier and more affordable? So just to repeat, George, and thank you, George, just to repeat that question. Recently, affordability of a home against the average adult income has hit its lowest level since the Victorian era. What are the causes of this issue and what possible solutions are there to make home owning easier and more affordable? Now, I want to focus on those solutions Please, and, I, and I'm going to come to you, Harrison, first. How do we make homes more affordable? Well, forgive me, but I um, do have to point out the elephant in the room that is the big problem. And the, the problem is NIMBYism. And it is an institutional setup that allows concentrated, entrenched interests who are existing property owners to use the power of the law and of the state to create barriers to entry for other home builders who would increase the supply of homes and lower the price of homes. It's not a particularly difficult calculation. Expand supply. What are the roadblocks in the way of expanding supply? Zoning laws. We need to liberalise our planning laws and we need to increase that supply so that prices come down and that the dream of home ownership can actually be attainable for most people under the age of 35 because if we don't get a grip on this, it's got so many broader implications for the number of children that people are having, from the environment, more densely built cities uh, emit far less carbon than suburban sprawl, for example. Uh, and we will also have a situation where people will look to leave. They will look to go to countries where the cost of living, where home ownership is much lower, where opportunities are much higher, and we are seeing in places like Eastern Europe and Poland, the Czech Republic, that we have a new group of challengers 
who are absolutely willing to tempt our young talent in this country away. So it's vital we get a grip on it. And as I've said, it's, it's not a particularly difficult calculation. Remove the barriers to expanding supply, and there is a, a, a market there, uh, sorry, a, a set of producers there who will come in, they will take advantage of it, and they will build more houses where people want to live. OK. Paul. Um, Paul, I'm going to come to you. You know, you're a local councillor. Is yep. NIMBYism the problem here? Your yeah, planning legislation is affecting your, <laughs> your work. Not, not only <laughs> am I a local councillor, but I also sit on the planning committee. Um, yeah. uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, there is a law that says that when a developer develops a uh, development, uh, and I'll give you the, the, the actual classic example on the Defence School of Languages in Beaconsfield. Yep. Uh, there is a developer who's building 350 new houses. And the law says that for a certain number of new houses above seven, I think it's seven or eight, you have to provide low-cost housing, affordable housing, as well as uh, the houses that you're building. And uh, I've sat on the planning committee for years now, and... Many developments have been approved by the planning committee because this section uh, has been a, a part of their submission to the planning committee. And inevitably, uh, a year later, when they come to start building, they come back in and say, unfortunately, we've done the numbers and we can't afford the low-cost housing, so we're not going to be able to do it. And the law allows them to get out of that, of that obligation. And that's part of the problem. But the real problem, I completely with, uh, agree with you, is nimbyism. It's, uh, the, it's people like me who have... It, no, it is. <laughs> a Lib Dem councillor in the South East a Lib Dem calling out nimbies. A Lib Dem Progress. councillor in the South East who, who uh, is, is, is a councillor in Beaconsfield who has his house uh, and in, in, a lovely, in a lovely town and... Most of the, my neighbours would say not one inch of green belt should be given up. Not one inch over my dead body. And that is the reason. If we want to build more houses, we have to build them affordable and we have to have the land to build them on. My son, who is a graduate of John Hampden, by the way, he is a lecturer uh, at Kent University and he's 36 and he cannot afford to buy a house. Right. Uh, right? And that's the problem. Why can't he do that? Right, Can I make uh, one more comment? Uh, uh, very, very briefly, Paul. Very briefly. Margaret Thatcher generous. sold all the council houses. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'm going to come across to Hugo. I mean, we found a culprit. Paul's owned up over here. But let's, let's, <laughs> fo let's focus on solutions. Paul I'm said that failure to deliver low-cost housing and the legal loopholes that, that, that permit that is a real problem. And he's blamed Margaret Thatcher. What do you okay, say so to that? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to agree on the Margaret Thatcher point. Um, I am going to agree uh, with you on the basis that we are both going to break the party line here um, because I also agree that nimbyism is a big problem. Alongside with that, as you also touched on, is what I like to call green belt absolutism, yep. uh, which is the idea that green belt is the holy land and it can't be touched. Um, and I'm going to cite a particular site that's um, going through at the moment, which is Wuben Green Lane in Beaconsfield. Uh, a local football club uh, have been offered by the developer, they're being relocated by the developer who's acquired the current site, and they want to build some really great football pitches on some shrubbery in between the M40 and the A40. I mean, this land is it's, it's stinging nettles. It's no one's walking their dog there. No one's enjoying this green space. Um, and it was voted down at a unitary level. Um, so the fate of the football club hangs in balance because of nimbyism and because of green belt absolutism. And when I say to local councillors, I tell them this, I go, you are aware that you've just voted against well, you know, if you assume the football club's got 1,000 local kids playing for it, I'm not sure if that's the actual number, maybe less. Um, think about how many, how many of them, well, two, two parents per player, 2,000 voters. These, are, these civic institutions, like local football teams, they have a lot of weight when it comes to elections if they can mobilise their forces. 
Um, and I think that local councillors, particularly in Beaconsfield, should take a look at sites like Reuben Green Lane uh, okay. with a new fresh set of eyes. Right, we've been focusing a lot on the... Can on I, the, uh, can on I just the, come on back on that? You can very, very briefly... Very the briefly. local planning committee here. The, the story there <laughs> is that that development of the new football pitches that he's talking about is to Let, replace... Let's not get lost in local issues is, here. No, is to, uh, is to replace of a similar one okay, that we, as planning, of, uh, planning councillors, put into the development of the new homes. Right, okay. And the developer wants to swap them for down the road so we can build another 65 homes on the green belt that we de designated for the sports field. And increase the housing supply. Uh, hang on, okay, okay. 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 Well, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I thought Paul was owning up here, but now it's the developer's yeah. fault. Dear, <laughs> is it, right? I'm gonna go, we've heard a lot about how this plays out at a local yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. You know, what, what kind of legislation do we need here to make affordable? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start very locally in Beaconsfield, and then I'm gonna move nationally. So I'm gonna follow up Paul's point. My, my mother used to work at the Defence School of Languages, and at the parliamentary in 2005 general election, when I was the Labour candidate in Beaconsfield, I said, and the, and the base had just closed, that we should use the Defence School Languages Brownfield site at Wilton Park, which is state-owned MOD land, for social housing for key workers. Because even then, 18 years ago, and I was in my 20s then, um, there was a lack of housing for key workers. Dominic Grieve, who was the MP at the time, I'm sure most people remember Dominic Grieve, said, typical Labour, he wants to concrete over the Green Belt. And I've just heard the Tories and the Liberals want to concrete over the Green Belt now. Um, but, um, so we've gone, we've, we've, we've gone full circle. But I just want to say land supply is an issue, but it's not the biggest issue. We have hundreds of thousands, actually, over a million uh, uh, units worth of brownfield land with existing planning permission that property developers are land banking. Yep. If we built houses on all of those brownfield sites, it would significantly reduce the issues. Secondly, we have got an issue in houses that are already built. If you look at the, um, the increase in the proportion of housing tenure of the private rent sector, it has grown exponentially because of cheap buy-to-let mortgages. They're becoming a bit more expensive now, and so we might see some landlords moving out of the market, which stops younger people getting into the housing market. So we need to control um, the buy-to-let sector and the private rented sector. And one of the ways to do that is to increase the supply of social housing, allowing councils again to build council housing and support them financially and allow them to have borrowing powers to be able to borrow for social housing. Okay. And the last one is wages. Wages are too low and people cannot afford to buy a house. Okay, Alex. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Richard. Richard, okay, we're hearing, we, we've become more solutions focused here. We're hearing building on brownfield land, we need more social housing, wages. Do you agree with, with, with what well, Alex has well, said? Broadly, yes, if I could just say, Paul, um, I, I was a councillor in Aberdeen, so we didn't have a planning committee. Every councillor sat in their own planning committee, we shared the pain equally, so I can, <laughs> I, can, I, I can understand where you're coming from. But I think there's, 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 there's a number of issues here that we've heard. There's not enough land that is immediately available to build on. There's not enough homes being built. It's about the mixture of tenures as well. Uh, it sh I can understand the dream for people to own their own homes, and certainly I sought to own my own home as soon as I was able, but the UK is actually quite exceptional in the proportion of people who are homeowners. The, the norm elsewhere is to rent, and usually to rent far more affordably, where other countries don't have such a, an, an explosive bubble of, 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 of buy to let. So we need to have a, a mixture of tenures there, whether that's shared equity or whether it's rental, and we need to have more social housing available for rent, for key workers certainly, but yeah. also for everybody else who also does an important job. And Alex is absolutely right. We need to have wages that are keeping pace with the, the cost of, of living. Harrison said something interesting. I don't necessarily disagree with him because he's describing the, the move that there is out to more rural areas sometimes where property is cheaper when urban areas become more expensive. And I see that particularly in parts of Aberdeenshire where I live. But that, that has a side effect of often squeezing out people who are going to those areas on lower wages who desperately want to stay in those areas and contribute to those communities. So ultimately, getting all these various moving parts working in mesh 
It's crucial for the vitality of our communities because ultimately we need to be providing affordable housing for people at all incomes and at all different ages and stages throughout their lives. And we're failing miserably to do that at the moment. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. I thought we were going to go into local Aberdeenshire football clubs and uh, whether we should be giving them planning permission. Thank you for avoiding that. And I'm going to give a final word here to, to Josh. And I want to get to our final question, which I think you're going to like. So, uh, okay. Josh. Yeah, so as, I mean, as another youngish person on the panel, I'm also sharing the anti-nimbyism that I think we're all kind of expressing but I think there is something for those of us who are uh, more yes in my backyard I think consent to housing development is important like I think it is an argument we should be trying to have I think there is a role for the states of course they sod what you think about this we're going to do it anyway but in the longer term I think if we're going to kind of uh, over a long period of time, have houses built in lots of different places, I think we need to think about how we can build, uh, win that argument for more housing. And I think ultimately, it's about building houses that people want to see in their local area. It's around building beautifully in the way, of, like, the way that creates streets formulate it. It's about having housing that people want as well as the housing that people need. And I think that's something that people who are Yimby, like yourself and like I think I am, need to make more of an argument for. But that it, 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 this has been tried, right? So Poundbury, the king's favourite place in the country, Poundbury phase two is now indefinitely paused because exactly how why you'd expect local property owners are objecting up the wazoo to phase two. And phase two is being built in line with exactly the same building regulations that mm. made Poundbury pa phase one so beautiful. What you have is a group of people who already own property whose house, f whose house prices are artificially inflated by the artificial scarcity of housing who can use the state to go and lobby their own concentrated interests and the state then has the power to continue creating that artificial scarcity. It's never going to change unless you get the state out of the way. But then when you have areas with neighbourhood plans which bring in the entire community, not just a small section of predominantly older people, you see that the... Uh, more housing is built in those areas with neighbourhood plans. OK, OK, we're, 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 we're moving on. We're moving on. We're moving on. It's been a great night for the Wooven Lane Football Club. I mean, they've had more coverage <laughs> than, you know, they could ever have expected. But we're going to move on to our, what I think will be our final question. Thank you. Thank you for that. That, that was, a, you know, the local and the national. We had it all there. Um, we're going to go to our final question, um, which is going to come from Thomas, who's going to ask us about Brexit. Everyone's favourite word. Thank you. Um, the UK economy is now 5.5% poorer after leaving the EU. Given this appalling economic performance and no apparent Brexit benefits, is it now time to rejoin the EU? Some excitable members of the, of the audience gasping there. Um, <laughs> Is it time to rejoin the EU? Who to, who to go with first here? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Richard, actually. I think yes. you may have a unique perspective here. Absolutely. Not to break down borders, no, but just I, put one I was uh, hugely in favour of, of Remain. Scotland voted hugely in favour of Remain, as did London, as did Northern Ireland. And it's a source of extreme great distress to me that despite that... Uh, 62% voting Scotland to stay in the European Union, we still ended up being dragged out against their will. And that is an issue that will need to be revisited in terms of uh, Scotland's own future and uh, future governance through, through independence. But in t asking me to look at it from a UK as a whole perspective, absolutely, there is nothing about Brexit that has enhanced our standing economically, socially, or culturally, either domestically or in the world. And as we found from the, some of the answers that we, we had in the immigration question earlier, it's made us turn in on ourselves and make us uh, seem not such an attractive country to other people, to, to other people from other countries whose talents we desperately need. I'd just like you to go back. I'm actually the, the SNP's spokesperson on Northern Ireland, as the, we're the third largest uh, grouping in the, in the House of Commons. And this week, yesterday in fact, there was a, uh, a vote on the, the Windsor framework. Rishi Sunak's great answer, supposedly, to the problems of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I don't think anyone watching him closely could have failed to have been struck by the fact that uh, as soon as he had uh, announced that deal with the European Union, he hightailed it across the Belfast and then told anyone who would listen that this made Northern Ireland, with its unique access both to the European single market and the UK single market, 
that they were now living in the most exciting trade zone in the whole world. Now, the great thing about this was that this was exactly the situation that each of us was already in before Brexit. And the question that he has failed to answer to my party leader in Westminster, Stephen Flynn, and which um, your local MP, Steve Baker, didn't answer for me yesterday, incidentally, at the Northern Ireland Questions, was, <laughs> if this is so good for Northern Ireland, why isn't it good enough for the rest of us? And that is a question. <laughs> And that is the question that this UK government is going to have to wrestle with during the remainder of this parliament. And for as long as Labour remains a party that will not take us back into the European Union or even the single market, it's a question, Alex, I'm afraid it's going to continue to bedevil your party also. Yeah. Well, well, I'm going to let Alex respond, uh, re respond to that particular comment, but the question was about the economic impact of Brexit. I mean, you know, we've heard the British Chamber of Commerce surveyed 500 firms recently, half of them still grappling with the new system, the red tape. Is it all about the economic impact? Is, 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 or, or, you know, powerful point made by Richard here. Do you accept these allegations, Alex? I'm not sure what the allegations were. I mean, my constituency vote is 70% to remain. Um, I led the campaign in the north of Leeds um, to stay in the EU, even though my predecessor lived Dem and he was the MP at the time. Um, and we can have regrets, but, but effectively, we, we, the, the, lot, the referendum was lost and we've gone through a divorce with the EU. Now, if you want to get remarried to the EU, I don't know if, if anybody here has been divorced and then try and remarry the same person. Um, <laughs> you might not be able to go back in quite in the same way that you left. So, um, if, 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 well, one, you know, a, 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 a party can't just decide on its own in government to, to, to rejoin because we use the constitutional mechanism to leave. And I, for one, I'm not sure I've got the mental capacity to go back through that constitutional mechanism again and have another referendum. I might have a nervous breakdown, and I certainly need to do a lot more hours than I'm doing now. Um, uh, secondly... But you, um, you're, I mean, you're a shadow yeah. minister, Alex. Yeah. Are you saying that a Keir Starmer government would, would not be at all open to any idea of... of I think, I think all right, I'll give, an, I'll give an example where, of where... Look, I'm not, what I'm not saying is, is that the relationship with the EU we're having now is the relationship with, that we're going to have to have with the EU later. So... Um, I, I recently led the first ever parliamentary aid convoy to Ukraine and the most difficult part of that aid convoy was getting the aid across the channel because we had to get an easement for the aid to enter the EU from the UK which didn't happen in, through any of the EU borders or actually across the Polish border into Ukraine and that easement's ending in June so we do need to have a different relationship for movement of goods even if it's aid nobody pays for into the EU, and I think that's the sort of approach that Labour will take. It's about having a practical approach that takes away barriers to trade and barriers to movement of goods and aid and, and other things like that. Um, and also, look, the, the government have put, and I sat on the Bill Committee, uh, uh, a revocation of EU law bill, 4,000 EU regulations, where if the civil service can't get through them all, we can't get through in Parliament, will just disappear at the end of this year. And those regulations, things like the control sewage dumping or air quality or maternity and paternity and the Labour Party will not diverge and not undercut the current regulatory framework we have which is derived from the EU and that's exactly what the government have done and, and actually once we start to diverge that journey back becomes harder as well. So there's a whole range of things, it's not as simple as just saying oh well we got divorced, we're married again now. They have to go through a whole range of things. And if you want to rejoin the EU, if you want to join the EU now, and I, was with, I had lunch there with the Prime Minister of Albania, and the Albanians want to join the EU, you have to join the Euro, and you have to be part of Schengen. And, you know, those are the difficult things to have a discussion with the British people about. Is that enough? Is that enough, Richard? Is he going far enough for you? No, Very uh, briefly, no, yes or no? Uh, no, no, no. no it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not true that you need to join Schengen or the Euro. Sweden uh, is a prime example of a major European economy which is not joined. You give an undertaking to join, but there are, of course, a range of uh, you, you need to go through in order to qualify. 
Okay, okay, the okay the up. ERF. right. But, but, but it's the fundamental point of leadership here that we're not seeing from the Labour Party, and that disappoints me greatly yeah, yeah. because they should be able to raise their ban and say, this isn't working for anyone, and we believe a better future is working more closely right. in alignment with our former okay. partners. Okay, I'll be disappointed if we don't get through the panel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right, Hugo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you, and let's go back to the question. Do you accept that there's been economic damage as a result of Brexit, and is rejoining the EU uh, you know, a, a possibility in order to try and undo that? So I think there's two things we've got to consider here is short term impacts Brexit, long term impacts Brexit with any economy, you throw a shock at it like Brexit and something interesting is going to happen. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen with our own economy. Long term, we need to look, how are we going to achieve these Brexit benefits? Because personally, I don't think we've gone far enough with it. I think we need to be looking at negotiating trade deals all around the world, um, free trade deals. That's what we need to do. But well, trade deals with the US and China still remain elusive. That's the point I'm making, is that we need, to try and, we need to try and chase these. I know Biden isn't particularly keen, but we need to pursue these deals. Um, I remember back in 2017, I was 12 years old, and I was sat in that seat down there, and I was asking a que question about Brexit. And I didn't really understand it at the time. I thought I did. I didn't. I was 12 years old. But with Brexit, I think we are so tired of it and as Alex said do we really want to go through the constitutional process again no we don't we don't have the stamina we're politically fatigued and I think we need to have business as usual for a while I think what Rishi Sunak is doing is bringing us business as usual he's a very he's a technocratic prime minister and I think that's what we need we need sensible politics and I think that's what Rishi Sunak is currently bringing to the table okay Paul I, I, I sense I sense you're going to disagree but disagree swiftly I agree with Hugo. Um, I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> um, the British people are not ready to go back into the European Union. There's too much, Whoa, there's too much uh, uh, constitutional turmoil that would ensue were we to su anyone to suggest it. But there are alternatives. And I think the key issue for us economically is the single market. The issue with the single market is that it requires to follow the European Union rules on freedom of movement, amongst other things. And freedom of movement allows people to come Im to immigrate back to the UK, which I refer us back to the first question. Um, I think over time, the, the, the single market rules are sacrosanct to the European Union. That was always the issue in Brexit. Because we tried, the Conservative government tried to negotiate the way round the, the single market rules and were unable to do it because the European Union refused to back down on those. And they never will because it's the underpinning of the way the, uh, the European Union works. So we, if we want access to the largest market in the world again, we're going to have to accept freedom of movement. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. OK. Josh, I think more, I think more broadly, we're, we're hearing that closer economic ties to the, the EU with the solution here, not rejoining. Do you agree? Yes or no? Yeah, I think uh, that is the kind of big question kind of post the next election is what Labour, assuming Labour are going to be the next government, I think they will be, are going to do about our relationship with the European Union. And I think all the indications that have come from Keir and other people in the shadow cabinet have been that we're going to be pursuing kind of bilateral agreements on specific areas that will give us a closer relationship with the EU and there should be some economic benefit of that. I'd push back a bit on what Richard was saying that Keir's not showing leadership. I think he is showing leadership in that he's putting forward a realistic uh, proposal on what a future government's relationship with the EU could be, which still has the consent of the British people and that is putting Labour on a path to win a majority at the next election by winning back those voters that it lost in 2019. Okay, and a final word to you, Harrison. Uh, yeah, the, We're all agreed again, except for Richard. The question, the question of, of Remain and Leave is a fair one, but rejoining, you know, after the Lisbon Treaty, it's exceed, it, it would be impossible anyway to uh, re-exceed to the European Union on the rather favourable deal we had yeah. beforehand. It's just not going to happen. Uh, in theory, I personally am in favour of leaving, well, would be in favour of, of leaving the European Union. I wasn't old enough to vote at the time. Um, but the problem with having a a single issue referendum, as it always is, 
is that Brexit can look like a lot of different things. I quite like Switzerland on Thames, yep. but that's not going to happen. We're now at a point where the democratic control that we have taken back from the European Union uh, creates a situation where the government uh, and, in fact, both political parties are almost entirely beholden to a, uh, a cleavage of voters who are very left-wing economically and fairly right-wing culturally. That is exactly the opposite of what I want to see. And so I don't believe that taking back control has any advantages in and of itself. The, the decisions that are made by whoever's making them is what matters. And to be honest, the idea of, a, of an EFTA Brexit, of, yep, free movement, of accepting, unfortunately, some burdensome EU regulations, not rejoining the customs union, uh, and sort of sitting in that middle ground is one I'd, I'd welcome. I think it's been pretty, pretty dire so far. Mm. And, and um, I, I'd also... Yeah, I'd also add that we, we uh, in the aftermath of, of, of leaving the European Union, we have found ourselves constantly being told, like, when we're going to get Brexit done, there's an, an oven-ready deal, that I don't we don't have the mental capacity to go through this again. Uh, sensible pragmatism isn't an option in almost any sort of sphere of decision-making at the moment. The Northern Ireland issue was not settled by the Oven Ready deal in 2019. I'm still not sure, that, frankly, that it's settled now. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to sort of Rishi Sunak's managerial approach, that's exactly the opposite of what we need. There is nothing pragmatic about overseeing the stagnation of our country. And, in fact, if I might just sort of argue finally... Um, Very finally. There is... <laughs> Uh, there, my sort of vision about how we can take advantage of Brexit is a little bit more radicalism and a little bit more unilateralism. Not creating trade deals with the United States, but unilaterally lowering barriers to trade. Get rid of tariffs. I think get, we rid, get rid of non-tariff barriers to trade. Let's not sit down and work this out and let special interests like farming groups tell us what we can and can't import from certain countries. Unilaterally lower... Radical barriers now. Radicalism and unilateralism. What a way. What a way to end. Um, Might as well go the full hog. Uh, absolutely. Well, I, the last time I was involved with this event, I, I, I did a speech at the end, and I said, perhaps you know, the next time we hold this Brexit may not be such the focus of the discussion. But here we are, <laughs> and here we are ending on it um, tonight. Uh, Thank you very much. I'd like to say next week we'll be broadcasting from the uh, Wuben Lane Football Club, but <laughs> sadly, sadly that's not the case, but we will be back next year. And all I need to do is uh, thank our brilliant panel tonight. So, Alex Sobel, MP. <laughs> Hugo Reisenberg. <laughs> Josh Westling. <laughs> Richard Thompson, MP. Harrison, our radical, and Paul, who's still to blame for planning, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, and thank you to both our student and main panellists this year, because sometimes it is nice to have calm and respectful debate during a time where arguably things are pretty tense. Now, speaking of our panellists, we have a number of gifts to be giving out this year, and I would like to invite my peers up onto the stage, and a massive round of applause once again for our student and our main panellists. Thank you. And also, there are a number of other people who have been working behind the scenes that I do need to also thank for playing their part in the organisation and the creation of this year's Question Time. And that includes our wonderful Men in Black team who have been running around in their bow ties, showing you all around and helping out a lot in the behind the scenes organising. Our AV team at the back there in the box who have been responsible for our... They have been responsible for our very atmospheric lighting, our sound and our live stream, which is, uh, has really helped with helping those who have not been able to attend this evening. 
I'd also like to thank Mrs. Mia, who has helped a lot with our hospitality, Mrs. Templing and Mrs. Bailey, who have helped out with the logistics of tonight, and f last but not least, you, our audience, and the people watching on our live stream for attending and participating this evening, submitting questions and so on, because this event would be nothing without you. Give yourself a round of applause. And I would like to pass the mic over to Mr. Hathaway, who will give final words. Thank you. I'm not sure I need a mic, and I certainly don't need to go up the steps. But um, there are just three very brief and very important thank yous that I'd like to do before you all go home this evening. Um, the first is to repeat the thanks to all of you. It's quite a grim, wet, miserable evening, so thank you so much for making the effort. And it still feels great and very special having people back in school. Secondly, um, there's a lot of people that have been mentioned and a lot of people, a lot of members of staff behind the scene that make this happen. But there is one particular person every year that steps up and coordinates this, and that's Mr. Parbury. So a round of applause, please, for Mr. Parbury. And as is customary with question time, there have been a lot of rounds of applause tonight, but I think the very last one should be saved for a special group of people. As Ms. Barbary said at the beginning of the evening, this is a student-led event. So I'd like to thank the student organising team, which is Toby Hewson, Karav Singh, Alex Smethurst and James Bourne, and led very ably by James Whitlock and Andrew Partridge. Thank you, gents. Outstanding. <laughs> and a safe journey home. Thank you.